Hello, good afternoon, welcome everybody. Um, this is a session about good capital and philanthropic investments. So uh, we are here. My name is Jamie Gouvi, I'm from Shaping Impact Group. I'm an impact investor. We have four great panelists and we will also listen to Sir Ronald Cohen who will appear on screen a bit later on. Um, so thank you all for being here. I want to start with introducing the panelists, left and right from my side. Janka first, Janka Petot, from the European Commission, Directorate General for Economic and Financial Affairs. Um, and you are concerning yourself with repayable financial instruments and you work with InvestEU. So what does InvestEU do? Or what is, what is that, what, what type of fund is that? Very briefly. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for, uh, for welcoming me to this debate. Uh, InvestEU is a budgetary guarantee, uh, which we use to de-risk investments of our implementing partners. So these are inter international financial institutions like the EAB, European Investment Bank, or the European Investment Fund, or others, and they can also be uh, national promotional banks. Uh, and we allow them to do uh, riskier investments than they would otherwise have done, with the aim to also uh, leverage uh, and crowd in private capital. Ah, okay. So we often, uh, our guarantee often serves um, to enable catalytic uh, sort of this, to, 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 uh, to have, uh, has this catalytic effect. Yeah, yeah. So you are sort of a guarantee so that there pe other people can take, a, you, you de-risk basically. We de-risk, we de-risk. Yeah. De yeah. yes. Next to you is, uh, Carole Mama, since 2003 at Bio, you are the chief investment officer. What does Bio do? So, uh, BIO is a Belgian investment company for developing countries. We are an arm of the Belgian corporation, so a public uh, company. And we invest in the private sector in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America. So, we support entrepreneurs uh, down, uh, down there on uh, topics such as financial inclusion, getting micro-entrepreneurs access to capital, agriculture, supporting some uh, smallholders, farmers uh, in, uh, in developing countries, renewable energy, so we invest also in uh, PV solar plants, in uh, hydro uh, plants uh, in the three uh, continents. So we are really an investors, either in uh, debt or in equity. Thank you. Uh, do you have a microphone, Pascal? Pascal. <laughs> Amongst other things, uh, you're the founder of the Demeter Foundation. You are on the board of the European Venture Philanthropy Association. Uh, some other philanthropic boards as well. Uh, you are an experienced venture capitalist, I believe. So, and what does the Demeter Foundation do? So the Demeter Foundation uh, tries to promote innovative economic models for social good. Uh, 30 years ago, when uh, I founded it, we saw that grants was not always the best model and that we needed to bring uh, additional models because uh, the amount of causes, uh, the, the, the nature of those causes required other ways to, to be present to, so to bring long-standing long solutions. So in the case of Demeter, we invest only through what I call convertible, returnable grants. So because we are a foundation, we still give grants, but those grants can be converted if someone comes in the same program with uh, more attractive financial instruments afterwards, and it can be returned if the program becomes self-sufficient, which is obviously our target when we, when we invest, in order to uh, not to, to, to make us richer, because we do not take any interest or return on our investment, but just to enable us, I mean, to invest with, with, with someone else. So the idea is to show that even as a charitable foundation, you can completely have an investment mindset. Thank you. So we have the EU, we have uh, uh, a national investment arm, uh, Bio, a foundation. Stephen, Sir Niels, uh, I know Stephen for some time now, so you are an experienced entrepreneur, but also an innovator in the impact sector. You. Uh, started one of the first impact investing funds, accelerators, and now you're doing something new at Impact Finance Belgium. And what is that? <laughs> you, you pronounce it very well, Jamie. And impact. slow, and slow. <laughs> impact Finance Belgium. Yeah. Impact Finance Belgium, in fact, is, is a network, a go-to place, a membership organization for everyone who wants to deploy capital, uh, ranging from 
grants, engage grants to impact capital into green and deep green investments. And so we intend to do policy and, and advocacy, uh, peer learning like any network, of course, also start innovative programs in deep green investing and also uh, be part of a European consortium uh, towards the Commission. And really in Belgium, for the Belgian community? This is for all yeah. Belgian actors investing in Belgium or outside Belgium. Yeah. And, and the session is called Good Capital, so what does that mean to you, yeah. Good Capital? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was thinking about this question, Jamie, and I thought this is a one million dollar question. It's like asking what's a good human, so... We can, we can talk about that later. You can talk about yeah. So take my answer with a <laughs> pinch of salt. Okay. Uh, but I, I always, if I think about good capital, I start to reflect, what would I not classify as good capital? And there are a lot of philanthropists here in the room. I think giving is great and we have to continue doing that, but only giving because it creates a good feeling I think it's not good enough. We have to go beyond that. At the other extreme, you have investors, a financial world, where the purpose of finance is more finance. I don't call that good capital either. So somewhere in between those two, I think, is, is, is good capital. And to make it a bit more concrete, um, at least I think there might be more, but two characteristics I always try to check. The first is that if you talk about good capital, there should be an intentional, upfront, concrete engagement towards a goal of prosperous people, planet, and so on and so forth. So upfront, not after the facts. And second, you should hold yourself accountable. You should make sure that while you invest, after the investment, you also reflect whether you got where you wanted to go. So these are two characteristics. There are different types of good capital. Donations can be very good capital. But I think donations, as I said before, they have to go to that additional step of defining what's going to be my result. And we get more sophisticated, so I'm positive about that. Sophisticated, if you're working in a small uh, social enterprise and you guide non-accompanied minor kids, refugees, then it's not good enough to count the number of kids you educate. You want to make sure they integrate back into society. So defining impact, we're on a learning journey. At the other end, on the financial side, I see a lot of people investing with good intentions, but the asset test is when the financial returns is under pressure, they try to or they tend to put away the impact and they go for the financial return. So when do you give in on your impact for your financial return? So that's not really in the core and the heart. So let me stop by saying that I think that there's not one type of good capital and the future is truly where different types of good capital start to collaborate to accelerate impact for people and planet. Good answer, thank you. Yeah? Yeah, I think so. And, and well, voila. Uh, Janka, you've been walking around, I think, today in the conference already. What is, what is your take on, on good capital? So how do you see that? I, I fully agree with Steven that it's a one million dollar question. Good. <laughs> uh, but I have been thinking about that as well. And I think this question could be approached from so many angles. And also it has so many layers that could be peeled off like an onion, you know. Um, for instance, um, would good capital be considered simply capital which is invested, deployed in a legal way that doesn't do anything illegal? I think we would all agree here in the room that that's maybe a little bit low on the ambition mm -hmm. side. Uh, would good capital be considered capital that doesn't do harm? Yeah. And then how do we define harm? And we have um, at also European Commission level defined the harm, for instance, for uh, green, uh, so sort of environmental and climate uh, related uh, aspects. But then there are so many aspects that uh, where harm could be caused. So, um, and again, is it enough if an investment simply doesn't do harm? Is it already what could be considered good capital? Maybe if everywhere in the world, all of our capital, 
whether private or public or, you know, from any source, would simply not cause harm, that would already be a huge, huge step forward. But that would be do no harm capital. That would be do no harm capital, yeah. but maybe that we could consider already good capital. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I think what most of us here in the room have, you know, <laughs> a thought of when we heard good capital first, capital that actually tries to create impact and positive impact. Um, and here the question would be how do we measure that impact? as Stephen yeah. mentioned as well. And we will have an intervention later by Sir Ronald Cohen, as you said, which I'm looking forward to myself because I'm not an expert on the matter either. Uh, so uh, he certainly is. Uh, so, so that would be very, very interesting to consider in this context. Um, uh, of course, uh, we could also consider other aspects of good capital. How is good capital deployed? It could be, and again, I think there is a sliding scale. A good capital could be deployed in a very fast way, um, very flexibly, if needed. For instance, we saw it uh, with the recent pandemic. Yeah, Huge amounts of capital were deployed, good capital for a good cause, uh, were deployed extremely fast. On the other hand, on the, the, the other end of the scale, we also need long-term patient capital that spans for instance, multiple, uh, you know, electoral uh, cycles and, and so on to actually support systemic change. So this is also something to consider. And well, where can good capital come from? Again, I think the first thing we would all think about here uh, in the room, philanthropy. Philanthropy is, of course, a very good source of good mm -hmm. capital, but I would argue good capital could come from anywhere. Yeah. And in particular, from the public sector, it should be also considered good capital, deployed efficiently and so on. So these are all, all aspects that, that we could consider. And finally, for me, uh, in order for good capital to have a very strong impact, it should somehow, the different sources of capital should somehow be combined and should somehow work together between the public sector, the, the sort of sources from the public sector, from the private sector, from philanthropy, to leverage each other, to, to support each other, to test innovative um, solutions which could later be scaled up and so on. And so there, it's, it's basically quite complex. So you can look complex. at so many angles. Uh, you uh, go down a rabbit hole of definitions. Exactly, exactly. Uh, um, so, so I would say we could discuss it for, uh, for a long time. Uh, but in the end, um, indeed, if we feel like the, like good capital is not harming, mm -hmm. is on top of it doing something good, and there is a, a pretty good chance that we can even men measure that impact, mm -hmm. that's already for me a very good uh, definition okay. of good capital. Okay, thank you. I want to go briefly to uh, Carol, also to Pascal. Maybe you can both think about the question, what do you want this audience to walk away with after our session today? So what is the message you'd like to get across? Well, the first thing, uh, maybe uh, just a small word on, on good capital for us. And that's uh, in terms of intent. That's also capital that follow uh, the alphabet of uh, SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, a world uh, without poverty, a world where people uh, can eat uh, uh, and uh, have water, have energy, and a world where there is a partnership also between all, uh, all players, all investors. So what I would like you to, uh, to the message that I would like you to, uh, to take away is that uh, collaboration in, uh, for development is essential. Uh, we, BIO, as investors, uh, we follow a lot of projects, but one thing that we're missing is also having good projects and uh, having entrepreneurs that have uh, spent one year, two years developing their, their own projects. This takes time, this, this takes money, and uh, philanthropy can play really a, a huge role in developing the entrepreneurs of tomorrow, the entrepreneurs that would help to develop their countries. and can shape also the economic agenda in uh, developing countries by supporting key sectors, uh, whether it's climate uh, change uh, or climate adaptation projects, renewable projects, agri-projects. So philanthropy has a huge role in uh, unlocking 
capital for good projects in the uh, developing world. Thank you. Pascal, a quick word from you. We are uh, on a time schedule, but I, I want to hear what you think. What do you want the audience to walk away with? Well, I, 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 I'm not sure about what good means, but what I'm sure is that there are probably some very important words to remember uh, to, to, towards goodness. The first one is we need to be patient. Social change takes a lot of time, and patient capital is probably uh, one of the most required resources because, uh, and that's where philanthropy can play a unique role because we can be more patient than anyone, anyone else. Second, uh, we should be useful. Uh, very often, I still see foundations who please themselves uh, because they are touched by the topic, they think they know the answer. We don't know the answer. The field knows the answer. How many programs, my, my foundation is very specialized on prisons, how many programs done by governments or corporates where no convicts had been ever asked what they would want for their insertion or what they need in order to come back into society. So it's very important that we place the beneficiary at the center and that we ask them how can we be useful to them. So that's the second word. The, the third word is not to be afraid of risk. And I know that risk-taking is probably a word which you would not typically associate with philanthropists. Philanthropists is seen as a very conservative, and it's not right. We are actually capable of being very risk-adverse, uh, uh, and, and, and that should not be the case. We should be risk-taking that what is expecting uh, from us. And the last thing, which is probably the, 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 the sum of the previous three, is if we do that, then we can be system changers. And today, uh, again, the, the, the social causes are so complex, I mean, we could see that from what Jenka has said, uh, that we need to be able to change the whole system. It's not enough to say, oh, I find a job for this person out of prison, or I find uh, 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 some uh, lodging, housing for that person. No, I need to find him a job, some housing, health care, family connections, and everything. This is a systemic change which we need to be part of. Yeah. Thank you. So it's. Uh, like you all said, it's about risk taking, it's about being patient with your capital and what it can do, uh, and also the intentionality behind the capital is important. So before we going to listen to Ronald Cohen, who has probably also has some good things to say about this, I want to ask the audience, you have some orange and green papers close to you or on your chair or somewhere near you. And I want to ask you if you agree or disagree with the following statement, and obviously if you agree please the green and disagree the orange. There's always a trade-off between financial and social return. So there's always a trade-off between financial and social return. So I see orange, I see green. Ah, I see a lot of orange and also some green. So the most people think there doesn't need to be a trade-off. So quite interesting. We have an enlightened group here. So let's see if we can go to Ronald Cohen and we can come back to the audience later. Good. Just a one word of introduction. I know you from, um, from the Global Steering uh, Group uh, of Impact Investing. Uh, you are a renowned venture capitalist, but also very long already in philanthropy. Uh, a great key player in the impact sector. So very welcome and very happy to have you here, Sir Ronald Cohen. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure to be here with all of you in Belgium, which uh, has been a center of innovation in the area of impact. So for me, uh, good capital is separate from grant and charitable capital. Good capital is capital that delivers measurable positive impact as well as profit. And we live at a time when we're beginning to talk about how the flow of good capital is leading us to good capitalism. And that's what I'd, I'd like to address here. Because the debate around how we begin to solve the big environmental and social challenges we face is bringing us to the conclusion that uh, we have to change our economic system. Capitalism is undergoing change under pressure from three very powerful forces. And within uh, what I call impact capitalism, 
you begin to get capital that flows to achieve measurable positive impact. So what are those three forces? Well, the first you're all aware of. It's the force of changing values. Um, you have seen uh, young people over the last uh, 10 or 15 years move away from purchasing the product of uh, companies that are creating environmental or social harm. They refuse to work for them. It's influenced a much bigger chunk of the population. And it has been noticed by investors who are now channeling $40 trillion to environmental, social, and governance investment, which seeks to deliver impact as well as profit. When I chaired the G8 Social Impact Investment Task Force uh, nearly 10 years ago now, uh, the amount of ESG capital around was just 13 trillion. So we have seen a trebling over a decade. And at that time, there was no impact investment, which we define as having the intention of ESG, but measuring the impact created in a reliable and rigorous manner. And today we see $2.4 trillion, not billion, trillion dollars of impact investment, which is achieving measurable impact as well as profit. Just over the last uh, three, four years, we've seen the growth of a completely unexpected part of the bond market, inspired by the invention of the total impact bond, uh, which uh, Belgium has uh, harnessed and which I'm proud to have played the role in, in inventing, in the form of sustainability-linked bonds and loans, where a company borrows money and reduces its cost of capital if it achieves a certain uh, targets, environmental or social, uh, that have been pre-agreed with investors. So there's a huge change in values. And then there's a massive leap in technology. Again, all of you are aware of that. You're all reading about artificial intelligence and machine learning, augmented reality, the genome and powerful computing coming together. The leap in technology, I can say as a venture capitalist who started at the age of 26 in the very early days of the tech revolution, the leap in technology today is as big as the leap that the microchip brought. And it's coming together with the impact thinking to define new models that optimize risk, return, and impact. And Tesla is the first of many trillion dollar companies that are going to be built on the basis of the new impact thinking and new technologies. And we're going to see every sector, just as the microchip disrupted every sector, every sector disrupted by this combination of impact thinking and new technologies. We're seeing it already in education, remote education, remote health, we're seeing it, of course, in transport. We're seeing it in clean energy. We're seeing it in fintech. Every sector is going to be transformed by the convergence of impact and technology. And the third force is the force of which most of you will be least aware. And that is that these new technologies enable us to measure in a granular way the impacts that companies create so that we can look and turn into monetary terms the environmental impact of companies, the work at Harvard Business School, which I've been proud to chair, the Impact Weighted Accounts Initiative, open source, we can all access the data sets and the reports, enables you to have insights we could never have before. Out of 3,000 companies whose environmental impact from operations we've measured, 450 create more environmental damage than they make in profit a year. A thousand create environmental damage equivalent to a quarter or more of their profit. Similarly, if you look at the social impact of a company and you measure diversity, 
and the diversity cost to a community, you count as the remuneration that that uh, community foregoes because its members, gender or ethnic uh, community members are excluded, you can see that Amazon's diversity debit is uh, six and a half billion a year versus Apple at two and a half billion a year. But that if you relate it to the weight bill of each company, Amazon is actually the better performer with 16% versus Apple with 25% diversity debit relative to weight bill. And this month, the Securities Exchange Commission, which regulates the financial markets in the United States, is proposing the mandatory disclosure of all environmental impacts created by every company. We've never had that with capitalism before. The ISSB, led by Emmanuel Faber, the former CEO of Danone, which covers accounting in the whole world apart from the US, is standardizing social and environmental impact. And the EU, as you all know, has already imposed a level of transparency through its taxonomy, through categorization, on the impacts that investment vehicles create. So the world is moving in the direction of impact accounting. And my prediction is that within the next three to five years, we're going to see many companies publishing impact statements which show their revenues, their costs, and their impact. And so I'll close by saying that the good capital then will be the capital that flows within our economies to create measurable positive impact and bring solutions to the great challenges we face while optimizing that impact with the return and the risk that investment involves. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sir Ronald Cohen. Um, so the forces that we're seeing uh, today, that's what Ronald Cohen is talking about. So are there any questions for Sir Ronald Cohen? Could I ask a question to yeah. uh, yes, yes, for sure. Ronald Cohen? Thank you very much for your very nice speech. Uh, there was one thing that was striking me, uh, what you said in your introduction, where you define good capital as capital that provides an impact and a profit. Would you consider also certain parts of uh, grants and, and, and engaged uh, donations also as good capital, or do you see this as outside the system? I, I don't see it as capital. When capital implies investment, money can be in the form of grants and philanthropy is total impact money, if you like. But I like to think that we have to go, as you said, Stephen, in your own comments, we have to go beyond giving money away to solve problems if we want to meet the great challenges we face. And therefore, for me, capital is investment capital capital that can be recycled in the way that you were saying, uh, that harnesses entrepreneurship and innovation to solve the big issues that uh, we face, that is going into climate change, new forms of energy like hydrogen, carbon capture, and, uh, and so on. So I like to make a distinction between grant money and investment capital. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. There's a question in the audience. Oh, there's a, a microphone coming. My name is uh, Dave Bircher, um, and I, I'm actually from a, an NGO based here in, in Belgium. But I'm wondering, in terms of the conversation around good capital, there's been so much that's happened over the last few years um, that's coincided with a huge rise in, um, in the markets. And so there's been so much capital to be used and deployed. And I'm wondering, as the market becomes tighter and is squeezed, what are the risks for good capital? And what are the people with capital able to do to make sure that good capital is protected and deployed? 
cyclical downturn in, in finance and in business, it tends to slow things down. And in the case of the, the environmental effort, for example, the closer we get to transparency on environmental impact, the more the companies that feel threatened by this transparency push back. And that's what we're going through at the moment. We're going through both these effects, except that the environmental threat keeps mounting. And so governments in many places uh, are becoming more aware of the fact that there are sources of capital in the trillions, as we were saying, that they can use to supplement their social and their environmental budgets. There's also an unexpected consequence from the Russia-Ukraine uh, war. It's pushing everyone to think in terms of self-sufficiency in energy. But self-sufficiency in energy cannot mean fossil fuel only. Germany does not have access to fossil fuel. Most countries don't. And therefore, we're going to see a huge amount of money and technology and human resources going to define new sources of, of energy, which can be uh, created and viewed right across the world. So you have these countercurrents, and we have to distinguish between the cycle and the trend. The trend is to capitalism shifting our economies to generate solutions. The cycle creates opportunity for the opponents of that trend to flex their muscles. Thank you for your question. As I thought there was yeah, one more question. I think we, have a, we are good in time. Is it? Yeah. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Kapil Kanungo. I work at Encofin, an emerging markets focused impact investor in Belgium. Um, a question that I have is uh, talking about good capital, we spoke about uh, the example of Tesla. Now, uh, I'm on the fence when it comes to companies uh, such as Tesla because while there is definitely a positive environmental impact, uh, should good capital not go beyond and also think about targeting? Uh, either the poorest or the most vulnerable because uh, no matter how great cars Tesla makes, they can still only be afforded by, say, the top one or two percent of the world. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Totally, totally. And I think uh, Tesla has uh, been used as an example of optimizing risk and return and impact in the environmental area. And there are questions there because we don't measure all of the environmental impacts that Tesla creates. And you will have read a lot about how much uh, environmental damage may be caused uh, by the, the, the production of uh, Tesla batteries, uh, for example, for its cars. But the transparency will come to encompass every aspect, including the supply chain of companies like Tesla. But if you look at the social dimension. Uh, the social dimension has not had, as you pointed out, uh, the same attention as the environmental one. And what we're seeing across the world today is the consequence of capitalism ignoring the social dimension. What do I mean by that? The huge gap between rich and poor, which has expanded over the last three or four decades to get to uh, a peak uh, today, similar to the situation before the 1929 crash. That gap creates huge social tensions and gives a feeling for the half of the population that hasn't seen its uh, real incomes rise over a period of uh, 20 or 25 years. Uh, during that period, the average uh, US salary has gone up 14% in real terms. And uh, the top uh, 1 or 10% have seen their real income go up 100% during, during that period. And so 
as we begin to bring transparency to the social impact, uh, and you can see it in the Harvard Business School work to which I, I, I referred, where you measure diversity, uh, differences in pay, differences in advancement, and, and, and so on. Um, then you, when you begin to measure that, then you begin to shine a spotlight and create um, uh, a race to the top. Now that also applies to capital going to emerging markets. And it's very interesting that within the sustainability linked bond market, we see pharmaceutical companies now able to reduce their cost of capital if their pharmaceutical products reach more vulnerable populations in developed and developing countries. And so we have to use impact to guide capital flow to vulnerable populations. And that gets reflected in the impact accounting. And when you have an impact statement that says your revenues, your costs, and your impact, your operational impact on the environment, and your human impact uh, through your employment on uh, people, and your product and your supply chain impacts on people and the environment will all be expressed in monetary terms. And a company which sells its products to more vulnerable populations will see in its impact statement, a boost in the impact that it uh, delivers. Thank you, Sir Roland Gant. Maybe we can give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. And I, I wish you well with your discussions. I'm sorry that I can't stay till the end of your panel. No, I hope to see you soon. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank yes. you, everyone. Thank Good you. Good night. Bye -bye. Um, just going back to the question we, we asked um, the audience. So many orange ones, so people saying, uh, no, there doesn't need to be a trade-off, some green ones. Is anyone who put up a green uh, paper wants to comment on why, why you feel there's always a trade-off? I don't know exactly who it was, maybe. Yeah, yeah, over there, there in the corner. Thank you very much. Uh, John van Weisberger, Hefboom, Belgian organization doing uh, financing of social and durable organizations. Um, the question is a, is a really important one because um, quite often a lot of commercial banks advertise their sustainable investments as being um, just as profitable or maybe even more profitable than their regular business. And they weave with studies and things like that. But basically in the end, if we go for maximum uh, impact, maximum societal impact, we should be aware that there is a trade-off with the financial aspect. There will always be a trade-off. Or at least we have to be honest that in the majority of cases, there will be a trade-off. Um, why do we quite often want to, want to make it uh, appear more interesting than it actually is? We have to be realistic that if you want maximum societal impact, that you actually have to be realistic about what your financial returns will be. And if you want to promise big uh, financial returns, that, that you will have to draw away from the societal impact. It would be nice to hear your views on that. Yeah, thank you so much. I will go to the panel later. So there's always a trade-off. You, you have to be realistic, you're saying. So is anyone with the orange paper wants to say something? Someone who's, yeah, there's someone on the other side. My name is Paul Boysens. I'm, um, I'm working for Incofin. Um, we impact investors. I think there is a nuance. That word always or sometimes, that, that's, that's an important one. I think, so what we do, we, impact, we invest for impact. Mm -hmm. And we will always make sure that we have impact. In certain cases, in markets that are not mature, the returns will be lower. The financial returns. The financial returns will be lower. In other cases, in mature markets, the, the returns, the financial returns will be um, at par with, an, um, with, with other investments. I think there is, there, is, there is a scale and there are investments needed in all those categories. But John, I agree with you. In certain categories, it is extremely important to target a low return. Yeah, and to be realistic about it, maybe. Thank. Oh, good, good, good. Thank you. Um, 
Stephen, what do you think about uh, this statement? I very, mu very much like your approach, Paul. I've been struggling with these questions uh, for, for ages. But I think since five, six, seven years, we've become smarter and more sophisticated in the positive sense of the word. So I think the question itself is irrelevant for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's very contextual, as you say. Sometimes in hard to get uh, areas, in certain social challenges, where we're immature, preventive health, we're moving there. Yes, you need constructions where philanthropic capital and commercial capital, and I kind of balance out a little bit in order to co accommodate uh, the impact you want to create. In certain areas, there is no financial return at all. In my example of non-accompanied minors, don't go for a financial return. It's a public good. You have to do this for those kids coming from Syria, uh, Pakistan, and so on and so forth. But whoever would have been thinking that six, seven years ago, renewable energy would, on the financial return level, be at par or even outperforming other investments. So. It's contextual, it depends on the life cycle, and it depends on the social challenge and the market you address. And that's what I like very much. If we get sophisticated, we can upfront try to target the right balance, not a trade-off. Thank you. Carol, there's people that say, yeah, if you invest in Africa, there's no trade-off because everything you do there is sort of benefits the people and, and environment, etc. So how do you how do you look at that? I think there is a trade-off. When you invest in the developing countries, in very risky sectors, and you try to be innovative in what you do, then you need to accept the fact that you might lose money. But um, I'm, I've, I do believe a bit like uh, Stephen, that is at the same time, uh, by being innovative, you can also create market. When you create market, and when these markets are successful, it can be also a, a huge source of profits. There is a little chance that uh, this works really well. In fact, being conservative on the way you invest uh, might not be the, the right solution even for return. Because if you're investing in uh, assets, for instance, uh, uh, oil assets that become stranded in 10 years because we will uh, all have needed to, to, to shift to another source of energy, then you, at first you can think that you're making a good investment and eventually, in fact, you're just getting to the wrong direction. So you, you, must, you must stay at the top of the, of the wave on this. Thank you. Um, Janka, going back to Sir Ronald Cohen, he was talking about three forces, force of value, the force of technology, but also the, that one of measuring the impact. So you're from the EU, so you would be perfectly placed to, 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 to work with this topic or to, have a, yeah, to, to build some sort of common knowledge or common language. How is the EU working on this topic? Or do you even know? Maybe it's, it's uh, your still early stage. Yes. Um, so I do not work uh, precisely on the, on, on the work streams which are related to the regulatory aspects. Mm -hmm. um, I'm responsible for um, our investment support policy and uh, in particular for the InvestEU program, as we mentioned before. And this is where I would like to come back to the, what the previous speakers were saying about building up a market. And this is what we are trying to do also with our support, uh, the risking support, where in particular for social investments, we have a, a social investment and skills window under InvestEU, uh, under which we also do impact investing, our implementing partners, such as the EIF, do impact investing. And this is where we have seen over the years that also through our support, they were able to really build up the impact investing market in Europe. Um, and this is also because uh, there is indeed this trade-off, especially at the beginning, where um, they, they have to count with lower financial returns. And this is where, where we come in uh, with our public money. So, so this is where I believe uh, public-private collaboration could be very useful. And in that context, uh, indeed, uh, our EIF colleagues in particular, they were also uh, building up the market in the sense of capacity building of impact investors and supporting them in um, developing their uh, impact measurement uh, sort of uh, um, capacities, capabilities. Um, 
And uh, um, I believe that our EIF colleagues have been working with the methodology since 2012, um, which was uh, designed in cooperation with the academia, uh, where they really uh, help impact investors um, define in impact indicators for their portfolio companies, which are specific to each company, uh, then uh, uh, set uh, targets, quantifiable targets um, on, on these uh, indicators, and also assign a relative weight to each indicator, so that uh, at the end they can, of course, um, uh, monitor the progress and the impact achieved, uh, to which also um, the, the, um, the carry, a sort of the performance mm -hmm. carry, is linked in the end for these impact investments. Uh, so, for, the, so for the teams, for the fund managers. For the teams, for mm -hmm. the fund managers, indeed. So uh, we are supporting um, uh, this, uh, this field uh, in our own indirect way, you know, through our support to the EIF and to their impact investments. Okay, thank you. Um, Pascal, because uh, you, you've worked on both sides, you, you're the founder of a foundation, a uh, board member of several foundations, also uh, very well known to venture capitalism. So if we all start measuring our impact, what would be the effect on, on the foundations? Because, yeah, I mean, if we all show off what we do good, what would be the effects on foundations? Well, I, I think that there, we, we need to think about continuum of capital. Uh -huh. I think that certain causes are at the start of our understanding and others are more, more mature. And at the beginning, we should not expect returns. And, and we, what is the continuum of capital? Maybe The continuum is that most, uh, what I see in, 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 that the difference between non-profit and for-profit uh, for me will disappear. There will be a situation where you need to finance a solution and to finance a solution, you will need a mix of non-profit non, non instruments, I don't even say organization, non-profit instruments, and for-profit returns. It's, uh, you have an educational problem, certain things need to be sorted out through donation in order to understand what the diagnostic and what needs to be do, what we need to do, and then you need to find solution and scale them up, and that needs to be with profit. Uh, we, do, we see that, for example, in medical research, and that has been accepted already, I mean, for, for decades, where there will be donations by big foundations in order to try to investigate a solution for Alzheimer, and we hope one day there will be successful drugs for Alzheimer, for example. Okay. I do believe that this is going to come for social causes, and that the difference between uh, the, 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 this uh, I am non-profit, I'm for profit is going to be, you know, I'm part of that continuum of capital. Everyone has a role at a certain stage. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. Can I just add to that because I, I like very much two things you said and I want to reinforce them. First of all is what you said, horses for courses. Try to use the right capital at the right moment for the right purpose. But you said something else which triggered my mind, Pascal, very much is if we start from the solution, and you said it before, the beneficiary should be at the heart, and you re-engineer back to what you need when, you might need grants at a certain moment in time. You might continue to need grants to build a meta level and understanding and so on and so forth. At the same time, you might need commercial capital, very risky, to grow it, and later on to mainstream it with different commercial capital. So if you start from the challenge and re-engineer back, we automatically come to two things put the beneficiary back in the center of the discussion. Finance, the purpose of finance is not more finance, it's a better society and a better economy. Finance is a means to an end, it's not an end in itself. And we kind of start to see the picture of which type of capital contributes to the solution. So thank you for that. You get an applause. So what you're saying, Stephen, is that we should not look in silos and, and, and use one head to look at the, at the grants and then look with another glasses or uh, head on to, to look at an investment. So basically, we have to be more uh, holistic. So maybe another question to the audience using the cards, and, and I will come to your question. Um, we should use the same criteria when we think about an investment or when we think about a donation. Who agrees? Who is green? So we think we should use the same criteria when we do a donation and when we do an investment. So who agrees that's green? 
disagree, orange. Ah, that's interesting. That's interesting. Anyone wants to comment on why you put on the green or the, the orange one? Yeah, there's one. Uh, Doug Ivan Le Grand from the Foundation for Future Generations. Oh, yeah. um, I'm, I think it's a bit parallel to the previous discussion. There are cases where uh, the same criteria can apply, but there are cases when, um, the, 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 compared to the objective of what you want to do, um, the, 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 the measurement criteria of, a, of success of a, of a grant will be different. If you invest in a very innovative um, situation where you cannot uh, describe what the end result should be, but you invest in a process, actually, in a long-term, open-ended process, um, trying to build trust with different kinds of stakeholders and so on, the whole idea of measuring impact takes a, a different shape than when you invest into a company, for example. Uh, so, up to a certain point and to a certain circumstances, the criteria could be the same, but there are, as the previous discussion, problems with the world always, it's not always the same. <laughs> Thank you. Carol, maybe you want to, what's, what's your reflection on, on the question? My reflection is, uh, I, I think uh, according to the, you are a philanthropist or if you are a private investor or public investors with impact, uh, you might have the same goal, but you're not taking the same risk and you don't have exactly the same additionality. So as a philanthropist, I think you want to have really high additionality to go where no other investors would go. And uh, so you're really, as uh, Pascal put it, a risk taker. And uh, that's why you have a, a fundamental uh, catalyst role, because without you, the other impact investors or the pension funds would not come in. You are the ones setting up the... Uh, the uh, shaping in some way, the, the, the project. And uh, therefore it's not the same, uh, for me, it's not the same indicator. No. Even so if you it's would the put same up objective. The, the, orange, the orange paper. So it's the same objective, but uh, when the pension fund will earn money, the philanthropist will take the risk. Mm -hmm. And uh, possibly there will be money also uh, at the end of the day for, 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 for the, the main risk taker. But it might be also uh, something that will not work. Yeah. Can I give yeah, a, yeah. a quick reflection also based on what Tanguy was saying? I had to learn, honestly, myself as well, talking to many philanthropists, we often have a debate about products and services and markets and these kind of things. There is also a big space where philanthropists invest in arts, where philanthropists invest in communities and cohesion of communities. These kind of things we cannot make tangible by products and services. So we should give room to that space as well without putting the same rigid criteria which we put on markets, products and services. So there is a whole space where philanthropists do play a role which is harder to grasp. There was a question here as well. And this, the sir and the lady was first. Um, and the Banker Children's Tumor Foundation. It's fascinating discussion. I have two, one comment and one question. So I think when um, we speak to our philanthropists, who are very often business people and investors, they want at least a value proposition. They want, if it's not a cash investment, return on investment, there has to be a return on mission. So that is in fact why I put up the, the green, because yeah. the way you think has to be the same. There has to be that endpoint and there has to be that return on something. But the question that I had is, when you were saying, Stephen, about the investment in uh, youth, um, is it not just a question of time? Because there will be a return on investment, right? If we invest in these kids and giving them proper education, it will not be in the time frame of a venture capitalist, but it will be in the time frame of a philanthropist. So what I would like to challenge the panel is to discuss the the thing of time, and that might be the long-term value of philanthropy versus capital. It depends a bit on your exit strategy. If you think that where you're investing, in the end, the market will take over, you're right. Because then there should be a tangible kind of return, uh, and in the beginning, no financial return. In the future, yes, a financial return. If your exit is a public good, 
then there's never going to be a financial return as such. Then it's going to be adopted by a policy. It's going to be adopted. Slavery. Can you calculate the cost and so on and so forth on slavery? There were economists at that time who said, if we abolish slavery, the economy will collapse. But there is more than just this transactional return, societal return or financial return. So I've learned through the years that there are also public goods and values we have to invest, which is harder to get, even on a long-term time frame, a concrete return. Thank you. You want to add something? Add to this, and this was mentioned actually in the very interesting morning panel on public private partnerships uh, that sometimes what you could quantify are the savings by the public sector. And that, uh, for instance, you know, on um, even prisons or, or the savings on uh, education that was achieved and so on. So, so there are other ways um, to, to consider indeed very long term uh, effects. Thank you. I think Just maybe on yeah. the first uh, comment, uh, I think it's very important indeed to have the same language. So on the impact, for me, that's the SDG. On the finance, I think we need to have the same discipline. Otherwise, unlocking capital, unlocking private capital will not happen. Yeah, that's interesting, using the same discipline. Sir, you had a question. Uh, right. Um, not so much a question, answering your question, um, <laughs> Victor Comrell from the International amazing wheat improvement center and you asked the question about donations and criteria and the immediate response in my brain was tragedy of the commons and I'm glad that somebody here talked about you Stephen about public goods international public goods the debate about what is what should be in, sh in future that's very important because that's a solidarity aspect first and then you can think about cooperative or private sector models to complement it yeah? So, tragedy of the commons, why do I donate? Um, for example, because I don't see anybody doing the kind of volunteer work with people who want to come into the European Union. I mean, that's a tragedy of the commons. And there's so many examples of that. And I really, do, I really wanted to say that very loud because that is critical, that that kind of action on the part of all of us will never be filled by any other means, I don't think. Thank you. You want to comment? Well, I'm... I, I am not sure it will not feel by any other means. I think that one of the unique role of philanthropy is to sit everyone at the table. We have the, the, the opportunity because we are patient, or, and at least we should be patient. We're not asleep, but we should be very patient, and we should be open to everyone. I mean, philanthropy, what I've seen from my experience, we're the only organization, social body, who can get the opponents around the same start of the table, who can get the public, the private, the corporate, the civic society, the unions, the media to come and discuss the topic and try to find solution or at least try to understand their differences. And from that, we can very often build the common good because at least when we start speaking with each other, there is a chance that we, we are gonna find a common ground. So I think that's a unique role of philanthropy that we should never forget. And independently if this role will lead us to make a grant or donation or, or, or an investment, that for me, that's secondary. But we have this role and in today's world with all this, uh, what I call I mean, this uh, friction about uh, the different groups of societies, wherever, I think we have this role as an obligation. Thank you. The lady there, do you still have a question? I Sorry. wanted to respond also to what was said uh, on stage around uh, that Stephen was saying. I think it's so important that we recognize that different situations, different communities, different moments in time need different solutions and different investments. And, and recognizing the fact that philanthropy's diverse toolbox is really one of its unique richnesses. Um, and the, the not putting that into a mold that limits our ability to act to me is really important. Um, if you're investing, as Stephen was saying, in arts and culture, if you're uh, supporting emerging democracies, if you're helping uh, young people in Palestine recover from trauma, knowing very well that the trauma will perpetuate, it's meaningful and it's work that you do in different ways and doesn't necessarily always come with a market response. So I think that diversity is, is really essential and being sufficiently fine-grained to target 
the right tool for the right situation. I think that's part of the challenge. If I can comment on your comment, <laughs> I think that that's really what energizes me, at least, is that we get this better understanding. And you're talking about democracy. It's pretty clear that we don't want commercial parties to enter democracy, right? So democracy should be a common good where, of course, there should be a theory of change. Yes, there should be a result. Yes, we should close the gap between politicians and citizens. So, yes, of course, there should be a reasoning. It doesn't mean that commercial parties should enter this space. So that, that's one thing. The second thing I'd like to say is we haven't seen the end of our innovation. Because sometimes we think press. Should press be a public good, yes or no? We've seen that press under pressure in Eastern uh, Europe now is tackled by pluralis, Max, you know very well pluralis, where a foundation with a first loss capital and commercial capital come together to accelerate free press. So we should not get back to our old ideas, okay, this is public, this is private. There are areas, thanks to technology, thanks to the evolution, where we start to find very creative solutions. And I'm gonna mention the um, Water Access Acceleration Fund, where, which was launched, I think, a month ago, where indeed, creating access to affordable, drinkable water in underserved populations used to be an area of donations. And guess what? By smart thinking of Incofin and Danone communities, they come up with a solution where it's financially sustainable. So we have to keep on pushing our creativity and innovation and not be black-white between public goods and commercial markets. You would want to say yeah? Do you have? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I just want to reiterate indeed that when we discuss uh, with the philanthropic actors possible areas where we could cooperate, uh, policy objectives, we have so many synergies and we basically want the same thing. Uh, whether we are talking about uh, support to vulnerable groups, uh, social inclusion, social innovation, of course, green and climate, um, even um, a support to, to news media and uh, to democracy, as you mentioned, uh, Stephen. So, so we indeed, we, we see that also for repayable forms of financing, we can, we can find these synergies. Thank you. So we're almost at the, uh, at the end of today's session. I do want to ask Stephen, because we are in Belgium, you, you've been part of uh, launching or one of the, the founding members of uh, Impact Finance Belgium. <laughs> but is it really necessary? I mean, how much money is, is, is still needs to, to, to move? Is, aren't we already on, the, on our way, on our good way up? Yeah, we did a study last year uh, on um, how big is the market yeah. for deep green. So money that really catalyzes clear, distinctive environmental and or social uh, returns. And it's sobering. It's one to two and a half percent of all capital under management that is invested in this space, which is about 10 billion in Belgium. Um, the good news is this is deep green. If you talk about light green, do no harm, it's over 50% in Belgium. We analyzed where does it come from. It comes, of course, from dedicated funds that have impact from and center, uh, like the Trividents, like the Incofins, like the Campanis, like the SI2s and the SI3s. So they have it from and center. That's the first kind of source of this type of capital. The second source are family businesses, single family offices that start to invest next gen into this kind of space. The ones that should kind of push this figure to 10%, because that's the target of Impact Finance Belgium, that by 2030, not 100%, but 10% is deep, deep green, transformational in its nature. There, other big parties should join the party, which is pension funds, which is banks, which is insurance companies, and regular uh, private equity funds. So they're on a journey from light green, greenish, to deeper green. And we hope, so by 2030, 10% is deep green and 95% is light green, do no harm. And that's our mission. Thank you. 
So I want to, before I want to thank you all for, for listening and joining this panel and being so actively part of it. Um, going to, back to the panelists, uh, Carol, do you have a last takeout, takeaway, uh, yeah, comment you want to make? <laughs> I think uh, it's important to be uh, investing uh, in a uh, good cause on the long term. I know uh, the, the economic situation might be uh, bringing capital uh, back to developed market, but um, continuity in investing in developing countries is, uh, is very important. Thank you. Janka? Yes, maybe I, just, I would just like to stress really our commitment as the European Commission to, to keep developing the, the impact investing market, to keep supporting social innovation with our instruments, and also I look forward to further cooperation, for instance, with philanthropic actors on these Thank goals. You. I think the leverage of the EU is super important. Thanks. Stephen, final takeout? Uh, a lot has been said. Um, I would say uh, what, uh, again, uh, energizes me is the journey itself. Where I'm less optimistic is that the pressure has to rise. We first have to hit many more walls because we, when we truly going to transform, we are transitioning little by little, step by step. But like any big transformations, I've been talking about slavery and so on and so forth, they need a lot of pressure before they truly transform. And so, yeah, we have to prepare for that. Thank you. Pascal, final well, closing I'll remark. <laughs> I'll repeat the word, take risk. Uh, as a philanthropist, it's your duty. Uh, and don't be afraid of innovation. Uh, because it's not because you're a philanthropist that you have to be conservative, so you can be a risk taker and an innovator. Thank you. Wonderful. I want to thank the panelists. Thank you for your uh, interesting insights, comments, uh, knowledge on the topic. And I really want to thank the audience for participating and asking very interesting questions and making a very interesting comments. Thank you, and I hope you really enjoy this conference and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you.